Well, I think we're going to go ahead and, and get started, right? We shall. Okay. We shall. So, my name is Scott McDaniel. I'm the assessment coordinator for MT Engage. Hello, I'm Mary Hopschwelly, and I'm the director of MT Engage. So, shall we find out who you are? Yeah. Oh, well, maybe we'll start at the <laughs> other side of the table. Over there. there we go. Yeah. I'm Heather Lesparky. I'm a graduate student in the English department. Um, and I've been working with the UWC in the intimidate process. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. All right. Oh, unless I've hit the wrong thing, Scott, on your. There we go. I think I need to stay kind of near you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'll go stand. Uh, you should be able to click this button here. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to um, start off today's discussion and uh, talk a little bit about MT Engage in terms of what it is and why we have it. Um, I'll say a little bit about the MT Engage program and how it is set up. Then uh, my colleague Scott McDaniel will talk more about integrative thinking and reflection and the whole concept of metacognition. Uh, as well as the e-portfolio, the electronic portfolio that is part of our program. And we'll conclude with some information about how and why this is important for faculty and for your students. Uh, if you uh, were looking around on campus last September, in the middle of the month, we had our first annual MT Engage Week, a series of events that we sponsored with the different academic colleges as well as student affairs and facility services. And so uh, we had uh, events that were as diverse as an evening film series at the Honors College, two science cafes in uh, the new science building. Uh, they were a wonderful set of events and uh, you should uh, keep an eye open for them uh, coming up in the fall of 17. But we're also delighted to let folks know that we have our own office now. We used to operate out of couple of the research studies here in the library, which was great, and we appreciated the library's hospitality, but we have some brand spanking new space in, on the third floor of the James Union building, so I would invite all of you to come visit us at any time um, at JUB 306. Also want to invite you to our open house, which is next Wednesday afternoon from 1 until 3 in JUB 306, and that's where you will find Jamie and Lexi most often. So MT Engage, what is it and why on earth do we have it? Um, as it was being developed, you might have heard a good bit about MT Engage as our Quality Enhancement Plan, or QEP. We are, as a uh, member of the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges, um, we, that is our accrediting body and part of our every sort of decennial, decennial uh, affirmation of accreditation is the development of a quality enhancement plan, a five-year plan to improve some aspect of learning on uh, our campus. These do not uh, appear overnight and MT Engage is the result of a very uh, inclusive planning process that took place over a two-year period uh, initiated by faculty who helped uh, to identify what our general topics would be and then uh, developed a, uh, a set of committees with members from across the different constituencies of campus to work on further uh, refining those ideas. The quality enhancement plan does not begin with the assumption that you are doing something wrong. It begins with the assumption that you're already doing things well. So one of the first steps they went through was to identify what is it that MTSU already does well? What are our strengths? And among our strengths are folks like those in this room, faculty. Faculty who already are invested in promoting engaged learning in their classrooms. 
Uh, but we also then from our strengths need to identify needs, what we could do better or would just like to do uh, better. We realized from various surveys, including the National, National Survey of Student Engagement, the NESI survey that our students take um, as they exit the university, that uh, one of our weaknesses, if you will, was students leaving without a real clear sense of how their entire academic program fit together. They thought the classes they took were good, the faculty were good, they felt that they left knowing their field, but how exactly their four-year experience cohered, that they had a little bit of trouble with. So that is the premise from which we started to build this program. MT Engage, that two-year uh, two uh, planning process was going on at the same time as the development of our new academic master plan, the Reach to Distinction Academic Master Plan for 2015 through 2025. And there was a lot of uh, crossover between the QEP Development Committee and the Academic Master Plan Development Committee. We wanted to make sure that the, the two documents were aligned uh, with each other. If you look at the academic master plan, it has three strategic directions and MT Engage directly addresses two of the three uh, strategic directions. Promoting engagement on the one hand and fostering academic community on the other. So we feel really confident that this is not just a program that sits on the side. It is something that is integral to what we are doing here at the university. As a quality enhancement plan, MT Engage begins as a five-year project. That doesn't mean that, at least we hope it doesn't mean that we go away at the end of the five years. Um, EXL, our experiential learning program at MTSU, was our first quality enhancement plan. So the goal is to have this five-year sort of project to see how the program works and then to embed it within the university itself. During these five years, we will be doing continuous assessment of what we do with faculty, what we do with students, what our program is or is not bringing about. As we look at our assessments, we will do a lot of reflection ourselves about what we could do to make our program even stronger. Um, in fact, at our staff meeting this morning, we were just looking at some of the initial assessments that are coming out of our first uh, semester of year one of five uh, of MT Engage. Embedded practice, uh, this is meant, as I said earlier, to become part of uh, what we do at the university, but also MT Engage is about uh, embedding practices that support student engagement in their academic and co-curricular college experiences into our courses and into the experiences that students have at the university. You're probably familiar with student learning outcomes in departments. We have them for programs and for courses. Uh, this is our uh, goal and our student learning uh, outcome. The MT Engage program, uh, to put it very simply, fosters a culture of engaged learning. And engaged learning that is not just about students learning, it's also about students learning with faculty and promoting that faculty-student relationship. Our student learning outcome is that students will use integrative thinking and reflection. And we'll be hearing a lot more about what that actually means. Uh, they will use integrative thinking and reflection to demonstrate their ability to make connections across their multiple academic contexts and experiences. And I think if there's any other word besides integrative thinking, reflection, um, connections would be mm -hmm. one of the key words that, that we stress in MT Engage. So what does the MT Engage program actually do to bring about that student learning outcome? We have two levels of the MT Engage program. The foundation pathway is where we have begun 
and then we'll be moving towards uh, our, our next pathway I'll talk about in a minute. Um, we began with the foundation pathway in which we are, have focused primarily on lower division courses, courses that are integral to our general education program. So that these are the uh, courses that are really at the core of what students experience when they come into the MTSU academic community. So we have worked extensively with the University Studies uh, Department on University 1010 uh, as a first year experience course, uh, the English Department with English 1010, English 20, 1020, uh, the Communications uh, Studies Program with uh, the COM 2200 class, um, all throughout the general education curriculum. But we also are uh, developing major pathways in which we will be working with departments to identify upper division courses and how we can encourage them to promote uh, the, the goals and the outcomes of MT Engage into what they're doing with their majors, minors, and, and interdisciplinary programs as well. We do have upper division courses already in the MT Engage program. So it's not as if these are mutually exclusive uh, programmatic in, in, uh, uh, initiatives, but we wanted to first sort of uh, bring students in and start to build the MT Engage program uh, along with their emerging identity as college students, and then to show them how they can take that all the way through their coursework. And eventually, since we have at least one graduate program director uh, in the audience here, uh, the MT Engage plan does call for moving up to the graduate level by the end of our five-year program. Uh, what I'd also like to say, though, th at this point is that all of this is very much opt-in. Uh, faculty opt into the MT Engage program. Uh, this is not uh, some kind of a mandate or a requirement for faculty. So we are really building on faculty interest and commitment to promoting engaged learning that already exists. It's similarly opt-in for students, although I suspect that many of them end up in an MT Engage class just because they signed up for that class and then they find out, oh, I'm in this MT Engage class. We hope that as they get familiar with um, the, the, the program that then they'll start to seek our, our classes out and as you'll see later it's very much to their benefit to do so because we have a number of incentives and rewards built into our program. Uh, similarly working with departments, majors, minors, interdisciplinary programs and graduate programs all of that is very much opt-in. We have certain goals as a program and we have certain uh, requirements that we work with faculty on for their courses, but again, how actually that is put into place is very much up to the faculty member who has chosen to be part of MT Engage. So what are these features of MT Engage courses that uh, we talk to faculty about? Well, there are really three major components of an MT Engage course. All of them involve high impact pedagogy or multiple high impact pedagogies. All involve a beyond the classroom learning experience and all involve a signature assignment. A signature assignment that includes an opportunity for a student to demonstrate their integrative thinking and reflection. And as part of that, then they are developing this body of work that goes into the ePortfolio. And I don't know, have any of you looked at the ePortfolio on D2L? Press the little, press the red button. Are you button. guys using it? Brent, are you using ePortfolio or just kind of clicked in? Um, I started one of Okay. Brent, are you using it or? I, I'm currently not using it. Okay. Right. Yeah, because you've been using other platforms for the okay. portfolio in, in our public history graduate program. Uh, uh, College of Education is using live text. EXL uses Digication. We, as, as MT Engage, we went with D2L because it's available already to all students. And students can save their work there. 
have access to it for five years after they leave MTSU. Even from courses that are not MT Engage? Oh, yes. Designated. Anything. It's, it's all there. Right. That's, and that's the beauty of it, that it's there for everybody who has access to D2L. That, that's the only qualifier there, and that's important, <laughs> an important qualification. Okay, so uh, the first of those uh, MT Engage course components, high impact engagement pedagogy. Uh, George Koo, working uh, with the Association of American Colleges and Universities, has done a good deal of research on what really promotes student engagement and student learning using certain kinds of pedagogies that will enhance the student's ability to learn and to understand their own learning process. Uh, the, init the initial list was 10, they've just expanded it to 11 and we've added one of our own. So uh, the one that we have added is reacting to the past which is a very complex set of role playing games that you can use in the classroom. The others are the official list of high impact pedagogies to which they've recently added ePortfolio itself as a high impact pedagogy. So at, at our university first year seminars, this would be University 1010. Writing intensive courses, now we don't have a writing intensive course program or curriculum, but many of our courses do require students to write a great deal. Undergraduate research, problem-based learning, some of us have probably done problem-based learning and project-based learning in our classes already. You'll see that we are uh, inclusive of EXL civic engagement, that um, the American Democracy Project, all sorts of things that our faculty are actually already doing. So what, why do we, excuse me, yes, Mary Ellen. <laughs> okay, that's, that's one that has actually elicited quite a bit of, of discussion among our faculty. What constitutes that, because you're right, a common intellectual experience is your students sitting in a classroom all together having an intellectual experience with you. But, um, this would be, for example, if the entire class attended um, a, a theater performance. They all went to a play together. They all went to um, hear a particular speaker. They all viewed the film and they did it together. Um, or in a virtual environment, they could do this and they're, they're not actually all in the same space. But that's the idea that it is something that they experience together as an intellectual experience. Maybe they presented at Scholars Week and for the class that does that. Right, right. And so, but this is a good example of how these are not sort of special things, oh gee, now put this into your class. It, these are activities, experiences that are present in many MTSU courses already. So what, what makes them high impact, why they've been designated uh, as HIPs or HEAPs, um, they, they do require students to make an effort. Uh, you can't just be a passive person letting it all go right past you. So they have to put some effort into it. And I think Scott will be addressing why that's really important in terms of getting students to learn. Um, they are experiences in which you build a relationship between faculty and students, like that common intellectual experience. Students get feedback, frequent and um, ex more extensive feedback that helps them then become better at a particular skill. Students start to see how they can take what they're learning and apply it in different contexts. And students reflect on their learning and then can move forward. The beyond the classroom learning experience, this is about as fuzzy as the, the common intellectual yeah. experience actually. Uh, the, common in, the, the beyond the classroom experience is meant to be um, an experience you uh, have your students do that's not part of the standard course work. So it's not homework. It's not part of, um, you know, sort of a standard assignment, go read three books, you know. Uh, they have to go and do something different. Um, so it can be a co-curricular experience, such as some of the connection point events. This was volunteering, and I think, Lexi, this is like what you were doing with your students in University 1010. They stuffed bags for daycare centers, right? A lot of right? the people sent their classes to 
freshman day of service. Yeah. And then they came back to the class and they reflected on, well, how, how, what did that mean uh, for them as students, as, as members of an academic community, being engaged in the community? Uh, I took students in my upper division history class to the Albuquerque Research Center where they heard a presentation about what an archives is, what a library is, how you do research in them. Uh, and that was separate from them actually having to do the research themselves. Uh, this semester, I, I'm making them attend one of two different events on campus, which then they will have to talk about in class. They are history related, and then they will also have to reflect on them in a paper later. But it's something that's beyond the classroom. In the sciences, my colleague Ginger Rao, she's going to have her students go to science, attend one of the Scholars Week um, activities or the uh, student posters, and then come back. And the important part is that they reflect on it and make some connections to what they're sort of learning in class. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Good. And that's a good, those are good examples. So you really tailor it to your course. Mm -hmm. So, you know, MT Engage is not a substitute for your course goals and objectives. It is something to be built into uh, those. Uh, the signature assignment um, allows our students to uh, gain a certain kinds of competencies, but it's also based on some understanding of how students learn. Uh, many of the concepts that we have uh, embedded into MT Engage are drawn from research like uh, this book, How Learning Works, which we highly recommend. They talk about the importance of making uh, with learning relevant, helping students make connections, learn how to transfer knowledge from one context to another, learning how to adapt their communication to the purpose and the audience they're communicating with, and of course, reflection as helping to promote. Is there a copy of this book here? There, there used to be. There used to be. Uh, there was a book club on this, I think, last year. So. Right. I know one time the LT19 has several copies, but we have copies too. Right. Okay. Which we'd be glad to lend out, as well as copies of another important book for our uh, for us, leveraging the ePortfolio for integrative learning. Now, at this point, I'm afraid I have to She's gonna dash, yes. and I, so, but I'm leaving you in good hands here with Scott McDaniel. And if I can't answer any questions, Lexi knows, knows all my things. So. so this text, the ePortfolio students are really excited about the ePortfolios. I heard from Lexi and some from others. They're really wanting to develop these. Um, and so. It, from what the text says, it gives clear understanding of what's important in the class, understanding of the expectations, and sort of the language of the process of the, the learning, integrative learning. And it allows them to self-assess and to sort of reflect. Right? And we'll show you some examples of those in a few minutes. Um, so the integrative thinking at the front end um, is sort of motivation, tension, and relevance um, from this How Learning Works book. So students motivate. Motivation generates, directs, and sustains what they do to learn. Um, and then on the back end is this idea of metacognition. Um, so you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means from, from Francis Fred. Um, so what is that metacognition? We, we've probably all heard of it. It's the sort of thinking about your thinking. And why is that important? I've got this little quote here. Um, it says, it asks the question, what do I know about how I learn and think? that will help me with this new situation. Um, it sort of helps them to sort of look at themselves as a brain. So it's their brain looking at their brain, and they're able to think of themselves as problem solvers. They can kind of step back a little bit, say, you know, I can, I can solve through this. I can think, think about this. I'm not just given everything to think about, which is what a lot of my students want. They, I'm almost too helpful in class. I give them everything. And, you know, what sort of problem do we have in life where you're given every single aspect of the problem? Nothing's really messy. So I've tried to kind of mess it up a little bit, and I'll, I'll show you some examples of that. Um, so building metacognition from um, uh, this uh, vocal, uh, be aware students may not transfer thinking strategies far from their sudden unless they are guided to do so. These guys need help, particularly the freshmen and sophomores, the lower division. They need some help. And it just takes some small adjustments. So one thing is to use pre-assessments. So um, it allows them to sort of reflect on what they already know and it helps sort of guide their thinking, so a pre-assessment. They don't come in with a blank slate. They already know some stuff, and sometimes the stuff they know is actually incorrect, and so it gives you a chance to sort of correct that. And after teaching for a little bit, I've tried to, to pause, and we'll even, uh, we've 
in the statistics community, we've been developing some modules for the last three or four years, and we have a spot on our, in our document that says, Paul is right here, and have students write down and reflect what they already know, what are the main ideas. And a lot of this can be done via reflective journals, include prompts, and here are some examples, you know, how well prepared was I for this test and quiz. One prompt we use is for like a test review, we'll put a prompt there and say, you make out the review, list the big topics that you think are going to be on here. And it forces them to go back and say, you know, what have we been doing? We've been looking at parameters, we've been looking at means, standard deviation, things like that. Uh, how might I prepare differently or more effectively? Uh, what did I do to try to get help myself when, I, when things got a bit confusing? Um, so that when they get stuck, what, what can they do? They can actually do something. And how did I try to help a peer when they were struggling? So all these questions sort of help them reflect on this. So this is just a, I took a snapshot of one of ours. This was the very first one they had. So we sort of helped them out by kind of recapping the learning outcomes. After this, we talk about, we actually sort of have a, a lesson on reflecting. It takes like five minutes to go through and how they are supposed to sort of write down the main ideas. They're often grouped up, they do an individual summary, and then they compare with their group to see what's going on. And so this is the end. So here, here's like the last question we ask, where they're doing some active, um, they're doing some activities in class. And now let's list the main ideas from the class. Because sometimes, particularly in math, when you have all these step-by-step -step and procedural things, the, whole, the big idea gets lost. And we don't want them to forget the big idea. So we sort of force them to do that. And then we sort of unpack that in class. It takes like two minutes to write these things down. And so my first day of class, I'll add, first day of class, I'll say, how many cups tall am I? And I have them to sort of give me some, they have to sort of ask the questions. And they have to sort of measure and figure stuff out. And I tell them if they can, uh, if they can get within two cups, there's no homework tonight. And they go nuts. But they don't, I'm not going to give them homework anyway. Um, there's, I think I was 182 centimeters. So they had to ask some questions. They had to do some measuring and figure that out. I'll just give them this, cube, I'll give them this picture here. And so what, what questions sort of would you have about this? Most of them, these are two coupons, you know, which coupon should I use? And I'll, I'll pitch, this out, pitch this out to them, what coupon should you use? And then I'll hand out a bunch of objects that I've taken prices of, and they've got to figure out which coupon is better. And we'll put those on the board, and then it's pretty clear something happens at a certain break-even point that it sort of depends. Um, but I allow them to sort of wrestle with that idea rather than just sort of telling them. Another one that I really like, I give them a, a little video, sort of the three acts. So the first act, I give them a problem. And all this is a video of this person stacking pennies up, this big pyramid of pennies. And I just ask them, well, what, what questions do you have about, about that? We all have, we all sort of see things in mathematics that are sort of interesting. And what kind of questions did you have? And I would type up all the questions and we would see them all. And the one I really want is how many, like how many pennies is it? Or how much is, how much is it worth? How much is this worth here? Some of the other snarky questions, why would he do something like that? Took him two weeks, um, things like that. How much does it weigh? Sort of another corollary. And then I say, well, what do you need to know to figure this out? Because again, in life, you're not given all the problems. And so it causes them to reflect, well, what, what do I need to know to figure out how many pennies there are? You know, we, and I can kind of give them that information. So I give them whatever they say they, say they know. And they sometimes have to come back, you know, we need to some, have something else. And then I play them a little video that finishes up and sort of tells them the answer, rather than kind of looking at the back of the book for an answer so they can watch the rest of the video. So that signature assignment um, involves assessment of the integrative thinking and reflection. So the students should be able to make connections to all relevant experiences, connections across the academic disciplines, and some of these sort of overlap um, with the connection aspect of it. Adapt, apply information to new situations, and be able to communicate effectively. And then the reflection. The reflection piece is key on all this. And so this sort of aligns to a rubric that we use on the signature assignment. And you have to do, you don't have to do all of them, but you have to do the reflective aspect and then a couple of the other ones. So the ePortfolio, I think a couple of you have used ePortfolios in the past, maybe not the D2L one, but you've used ePortfolios. Um, helps them to make, uh, make connections, sort of deepens that inquiry process when they're going through these and helps to integrate their learning because they're having to, uh, well, let me just show you a couple of these. So the ePortfolios, they're just sort of web pages, but they are about them and about their professional lives, about their personal lives sometimes. Sort of depends on um, the student and what they're wanting to showcase. Maybe they're wanting to write the ePortfolio for a job or for a graduate school. Those might be slightly different and they might emphasize different things. 
And so all this can be done within the D2L. I believe these were some of the first ones done out of the pilot. I believe that a physics major. I know Nick was physics. I'm not sure what majors Elizabeth and Nourishi. Um, Pre-med. Pre-med. Ag. Okay. So they allowed them to highlight. And I believe uh, Nick said, you know, writing the e-portfolio, I mean, writing, as you English you know, it's sort of the, sharp, the pencil sharpener for the mind, right? I mean, I, I don't know what I think until I write about it. And it forced these guys, when they went to interviews, they already, they'd already thought about it. They had already narrowed down their focus, and it really helped. And so here's a close-up of Rachel's, and they have given us permission to use these. And this guy, I believe, wanted to... Um, Pastoral worker, uh, pastoral work. So his looks is going to look a little bit different than the other ones, but it allowed the e-portfolio does allow you to embed video, embed your work. Um, Nick, I believe, did some. Um, I can't really see what that is, but this is part of his Scholars Week um, poster that he did. He could take pictures of it and post it up there, and then write about it. Definitely separates you apart a little bit when you're doing this, and no one else is. Um, the element of support that we have, this is um, Scott Hopp in the back. And he and Jimmy are helping, are these, are you guys helping students in this picture or is this faculty? No, this is faculty. I see some gray hairs in there, so probably some faculty there. So um, helping them with the e-portfolio. And so they've held workshops over the last um, little bit to, to do that. And you can come here or over in LTN IT, um, the FITSI over the telecom building, and they can help work um, work through that. And I think, Lexi, you're doing some in the dorm rooms for students? For students. And so there's all support, sorts of support for this um, sort of stuff. And so we have Makerspace here in the library. And do you want to give a quick 10 seconds of your um, University Writing Center? Yeah. Um, so the University Writing Center is a big part that we're really helping with the multimedia composition studio, which allows them, as students, to work on any type of Good, thank you. And there are a lot of benefits. This was supposed to be all Mary's the last few ones from Mary's slides. So uh, we've been talking about all the benefits, but understanding and trying to reflect. Um, that was one of the, the deficiencies that the students had indicated at that end of the year surveys. Is, you know, they didn't, there was no cohesion to everything. Nothing really, they didn't really see a connection. Not even within their major classes. They didn't really see how, you know, all these geology classes actually connected to each other. They were just sort of all distinct classes. And we're really trying to make an effortful, intentional um, connection between those and sort of force them to, to do that. And I, I even reflect on my own, you know, my, my, math, my mathematics classes that I took, I didn't really see a whole lot of connection. I mean, Calc 1, 2, and 3 I did, but then after that it was like, well, there's a little bit, but not a whole lot. When in fact, looking back and reflecting, there was a lot of connection. Um, so we have a lot of FLCs, professional learning communities. Um, what else do we have here? Improve integrative thinking and reflection by ability to connect. We've already talked about all that. And using e-portfolios is a sort of culminating experience for them. And so one of the things they're required to do is to have them submit, and they call it an artifact. It could be a presentation, could be a document, a paper, something they've done in the class. That gets submitted into the e-portfolio. And then later on in their sophomore, junior years, they can submit to get, is it a full scholarship, Lexi, if I'm mm -hmm. correct? Um, MTNGA is going to offer 15 scholarships, two per college and one overall winner. Um, 1500 dollars a semester for their last four semesters. A little incentive to do that, and um, Mary is actually right now working on another incentive that I hope gets gets through that we won't, we'll talk about later. And so, if you are interested, you can talk to me or Lexi, or um, go to this website. If you just Google MTSU MT Engage, it'll it'll come up. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Pete coming in March 21st. Going to give a, a talk, and what was the title of her talk? It's generative knowledge and integrative thinking. She's kind of a leading expert on how to promote integrative thinking within the e-portfolio process. And she's coming from the University of Michigan where they're very excited. Yes. If you're interested in, in really doing this, and you say, you know, what's, what's up with that signature assignment? I need some, some ideas. 
we're having a faculty showcase, and I believe we're going to have a handful of faculty come and share sort of what they've done with that. And then April 5th, we have non-traditional student engagement, and then we're having another uh, workshop on e-portfolios um, toward um, the middle of April. And we have Summer Institute, May 11th through 12th. It's uh, is it a day and a half, actually, I think. Or? We're looking at a day and a half, and the Summer Institute is really the way that faculty are trained. So we use that as our training basis and then, you know, help you get everything ready to go and formulate your signature assignments, training on the rubric, and then send you out to the wild. Yeah. And we had 30 plus faculty last summer, I believe, um, participate in that and are actively doing the classes this semester. And then we have a bunch of resources that we use to help compile this. So do you have any questions, kind of like taking a drink of water from a fire hydrant? That's a lot at once. <laughs> um, we saved about 20 minutes or so for any questions or comments. Brent? I have a question about um, for faculty that, that want to jump all over this. And, uh, oftentimes there's um, expensive that goes along with changing the way that you teach. Uh, are, are, is there any funding for you to use for, you know, for supplies, materials, you know, for things like that? Or is that, you know, is that can, you, can you give an example of one supply or material that you're thinking of that that might need? Um, like, okay. a, like a computer my or a... My wife teaches in a chemistry uh, program and she likes to use models in order to demonstrate molecular structures and things like that. And so... Um, so she's already doing doing a lot of this already, um, but she would like, you know, in her case, she would like to have model kits for the students to be able to develop in a kind of three-dimensional way to actually actively engage uh, with this. And so I'm not sure if this is something, if, if there's funding for them to engage for things like this, or if this should, if should be coming out of the department. Right. Like that. How, um, you said, how much would that be, you think? Yeah. What we've done so far is kind of handle that on a case-by-case -case basis. Right. And we're in the process of writing up some sort of protocol yeah, form. Yeah, protocol for that. Because we've had people come to say, you know, can we get some hundred dollars here? Can we get some hundred dollars there? And obviously, we can't fund everyone's class. Sure. Um, so we're starting, I guess, kind of a grant process <laughs> um, to see what we need to do going forward. Okay. Now, for faculty that attend the MTN Gage Institute, there is a $500 stipend um, for that training. Personally. Um, regarding the, the e-portfolios, I think it's, it's a great resource and, and something I think the faculty you know, we, we really need to be developing our own portfolios. Uh, right. As well. um, the reason why for our graduate students it's not helpful is because once they no longer have access to B2L, then, then it's problematic. Right. They're supposed to have five years. Is that right? Five years? Oh, okay. um, they're supposed to have five years after they graduate. And they have assured us, have Scott assured us that it's easily exportable to another platform. Like a couple clicks, download, and then you can re-upload it in a, in a common format that should be able to get unpacked and pushed into some of the other e-portfolios. You know, the D2L platform is not the easiest to use, and it's not the prettiest. Um, but it's functional and it's free. You know, it's included for students. Like, digication is very, very costly, and the ESL, um, they pay a lot for their subscription. Mm -hmm. And we also wanted it to be something that students would have, you know, at hand, even if they weren't in the MTA days. We want to encourage students to, to use that. So our, kind of, our plan is we have our own template, and we want our students to create something for us in that template. And that's what we'll judge for their scholarships and their senior awards. And then upon graduation, you know, we would hope that they would take what they've done and you know, use something maybe a little bit nicer. And, and there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing at all. But for creative people, it's more it's than... It's limited for sure. Than some of your other ones. What's that? Yeah, it's limited for sure, the D2O one. A little, a little blocky, a little dated but it does allow them to put the substance into it, if not the style. Mm -hmm. And you can style it up some. It's just not as free as a lot of them. Well, 
Well, that's good to know that, that it, it has a, a, a five years after they left, mm -hmm. it still exists, and it's easily um, transferable to this compartment. Um, so they say. They say. Good. What other thoughts do you have? Well, I think that's all we got then. You get out. You get out of class early today. How about that? I do have something. Um, so with the UWC, I've been working with um, in creating presentations. Um, also, uh, a lot of them are similar to what NT and Dave is doing, but the UWC is working on getting those together. Um, we have dates and times for that, and we'll be putting out flyers for those. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. There's a, a ton of support because the, the UWC, they have, you know, they've talked through their reflective and integrative writing process and, and so they're prepared to help students with that. The digital media studio, they have a ton of people trained in the e-portfolio and students can go for one-on-one -on -one training there, 20-minute sessions, beginner to advanced. It's, it's impressive what everything, everything that's out there to support the students in the process. And if you want to, as for the faculty, you can certainly come by our office and we can set up a meeting or you can just, you know, pop by if, if um, like or Jamie or myself or Mary can be there to help talk through things or help, you know, some of the logistics or whatever you need. Um, we'll, we'll do it. Sometimes you, something's a little odd. It, we can't pigeonhole every class and every teacher with some of these things. So, like they'd be on a classroom experience, we can talk through that to see what's appropriate. Um, well, that's it. I'll stick around and Lexi will do uh, for a few minutes if you have any questions.